Ellen is a senior curator curator of contemporary design at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City. Her exhibitions include Herbert Bayer, Bauhaus Master, Face Values, Understanding Artificial Intelligence, How P Posters Work, and The Senses, the Design Beyond Vision. Lupton is the Betty Cook and William O. Steinmetz Design Chair at um, uh, Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, where she's authored numerous books on design processes, including Thinking with Type, one of my all-time favorites, <laughs> Graphic Design Thinking, Graphic Design the New Basics, and recently, more recently, Design of Storytelling and Health Design Thinking, which were all published by Cooper Hewitt Museum. She's an AIGA gold medalist, and like you, <laughs> like me and many people, and a fellow <laughs> of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And I like your new haircut, Ellen. Thank you. You look great. Great to be here. <laughs> um, I, I do want to say, you know, a little shout out. Uh, Eva uh, Walczyk is here, our chair of uh, MFA Design. There she is. Great. Hi. And um, we also have our Dean Haven Lindkirk, uh, Dean of Roski School of Art and Design, who's already it partially introduced you and uh, and you know uh, is you know always you know right there ready to go and making sure everything's streamlined. So um, let's see. Um, all right. So Saul, you know, as I um, uh, mentioned, I don't know if. Every time somebody wants to come in, there's going to be a bing bong, but um, do your best to uh, figure this one out um, on your own. Okay. Um, so um, let me know when I should share screen. Uh, Ellen, you can let me know if you want to start or say anything. Yeah, before I I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Should I just grab the screen? Yep, let me share it. I think I share it, right? No, I have to share it. I'm hosting. I think <laughs> it's it's debatable. Yeah, I think it should be good. But I, I okay, share as well. I'm pretty sure you can share as well. Okay, I got it. There we go. All right. Looks like the ergonometrics are going to leave you with a pretty strong a neck ache after this talk tonight, Ellen. <laughs> I'll be fine. <laughs> so I am greeting you on behalf of Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York. Although our museum is closed and I'm actually sitting in Baltimore, but we're doing all kinds of stuff at the museum. We have virtual programs and education programs and I'm talking to people about design. I'm gonna be running some workshops with your graduate students the next couple of weeks. So I'm really excited about that. So we are your national design museum and we're out and about doing stuff in the world. And tonight I'm going to talk about some of my favorite research that I think uh, your students are going to especially love and it's going to inform the workshop that the grad students are, are going to be doing. Um, so this is an exhibition that was open at Cooper Hewitt in 2018. It's called The Senses Design Beyond Vision. And I want to talk to you about some of the ideas in the exhibition, some of the science, uh, some of the um, ethical and social challenges that we play with, that we faced in creating the exhibition, and some of the beautiful artwork and compelling ideas and problem solving involving the senses um, that we discovered in, in researching this project. So I, I did this exhibition with my colleague Andrea Lips who's another amazing curator of contemporary design at Cooper Hewitt. And the installation is designed by Studio Joseph and really brought the exhibition to life. So you'll see some installation photographs where there's this, these incredible curving walls made out of 
um, loose thread and woven thread. So you could literally run your fingers through the walls. <laughs> it was very sensory. Um, and when April asked me to speak to, to this wonderful group of students in the public, I thought this subject might be especially fun to talk about. It's really looking at design uh, beyond language. It's looking at design um, beyond some of the categories that we often limit ourselves to, right? We think of design as only being visual, but I'm fascinated with how our visual sense actually mixes with all the others. It mixes with touch and smell and sound. Um, this beautiful book design is by David Genko and, and David and I designed a wonderful book together. Um, that's really a, a manual of how to design with the senses as well as being a presentation of, of work from the exhibition. Um, and one of the things that's really unique about the approach that we took in this exhibition is we looked at sensory design in relation to inclusive design. Um, so other curators and writers in the past have celebrated sensory design from a kind of aesthetic or phenomenological point of view. But we took it a little bit farther and asked, how can sensory design be usable and accessible to all people, including those with sensory disabilities, people who are deaf, for example, or are blind or have Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so this was really an exciting dimension that also was then a challenge for our museum and should be a challenge for every museum at all times of how to create an exhibition that everybody could experience equally. So one of the essays in the book is called Deaf Space. Um, and it was written by an architect from Gallaudet University in, in Washington, which is the only university in the US uh, for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, and Hansel Bowman, this architect, has developed a whole theory of how deaf people inhabit space differently from hearing people. Um, so it's important to them that they experience the vibration of materials. Uh, that they can see people at different levels in the building through staircases and, and glass walls, that there is uh, sufficient room for people to have a visual conversation with each other as they walk down a hallway. They want to walk side by side and be talking to each other with their hands. So that was really um, radical to me. And, and I love working on a project where I learn completely new things, uh, completely new ways of understanding the world. So the notion of, of deaf space was um, really exciting to me. And we were able to implement that idea in the exhibition. So creating these transparent walls, for example, meant that as you were walking through the exhibition, you could see people around you, people weren't blocked by the walls. Um, and that's a really important uh, communication method for people who um, have difficulty hearing or, or who are deaf. So that kind of enhanced visibility was something we could actually do in the exhibition. Um, and people just loved being in this space. Uh, there was one half that was sort of cool colors and the other half that we called the candy store that was all pink and yellow. And so there is this sensuality to the experience that again really transcends uh, language um, and, and sort of brought people into this uh, shared kind of universal space. As you entered the exhibition at the very end of this long gallery was a fountain made of feathers. So the designer used circulating air um, to make this um, a, a thousand feathers 
continually rising and then falling back into this basin. Um, and it was beautiful. It used the current of air, which is something tactile, something that we feel. And it had this wonderful sound of a kind of delicate raindrop of these feathers continually falling back, um, often on the floor. <laughs> we did a lot of sweeping as well. Uh, this image gives you a little sense of the uh, exhibition design and how, uh, how sensory the experience was and this kind of beautiful transparency. Um, again, you could, you could touch it and no one would tell you you can't touch it. You could, you could touch these beautiful golden strands. Um, and really feel the exhibition. This is a piece called Snowstorm by Christopher Brogius, who's a scent designer. This is a whole field that I got to learn about, which is how scents are designed. So that's perfume, but also scents that are used in architecture and used in cars and used in hotels and all kinds of products that have scent. And so this project, this particular installation is called Snowstorm. Um, and it's these wool snowballs hanging from the ceiling of this little uh, lacy gazebo. And people could come in and touch the snowballs and smell them. And Christopher had infused them with the smell of winter. And for him, that's the smell of mittens and evergreen trees. <laughs> and it was really great. And then each snowball also has a tiny uh, bell inside. So it rings a little bit like uh, snow, snow bells or sleigh bells, just a beautiful piece. Um, and so we had a, a challenge to all of the designers who participated in the exhibition as well as to our design team to try to make the exhibition accessible uh, to everyone. And so for some of our designers, this was really asking them to do something they hadn't thought about before. Um, so this is an amazing piece where um, visitors would sit on a chair and they would put on headsets and the headsets would whisper little phrases to them. And the phrases are things like falling backward into a bowl of jello or having sex on a washing machine. We had to remove that at a certain point, a parent complained. <laughs> and so you were listening to this message and the chair is vibrating against your back and your thighs. And the vibration was unique to each of the messages. Um, so it's basically taking an audio file and translating it into tactile vibration, tactile sound. Um, and that same message was projected in light on the floor. So if someone were deaf and couldn't hear the message in their earphone, they could see it projected on the floor. And the beauty of that is that people that were lined up to do this, this is the most popular thing in the exhibition, people who were waiting could anticipate what it was about by reading that text. Um, and if you were using a wheelchair, you could hold this pillow and hug the pillow against your body instead of getting out of your chair and sitting in the wooden chair. And lots of people like to hug the pillow, right? That was another way to experience the, the project. Um, people really enjoyed this. And it was uh, an absolutely unique experience uh, designed by Eric Gunther, who's a wonderful interaction designer. Um, and this just gives you a sense of the pleasure of somebody experiencing this exhibit, having no idea what it would be. Um, so that was, that was really fun. Um, and so that was a challenge to, to all of our artists. How, how can you make sure that you're um, activating all the senses, right? And not excluding someone who can't see or can't hear. Um, and that's what inclusive design is. 
as a museum, and anytime any of you who have designed exhibitions or worked in museums, this is a really huge challenge. How can we create, for example, museum text so that someone who is blind who comes to your museum can actually absorb the content of the exhibition, right? Through description and just through the basic facts that a, a sighted person can see. So we, we made a challenge to ourselves, which was how could we create a museum label system that would be accessible to everyone. And we worked with Sina Barham, who's an incredible computer scientist, consultant, entrepreneur, designer, and advocate for people with disabilities. And he helped us, and that's Sina in this uh, picture, he helped us develop um, a unique experimental, will probably never be done again, system uh, for providing this access to visitors to our exhibition. Um, so we had these labels that all include a verbal description of the object, right? So look, just like on a website, you have alt text, which, which describes what an image is. So our labels all began with this descriptive text, which is great for everybody, right? Uh, there was a braille tactile uh, strip at the top of every label that had the title of the piece and would also have a unique number that corresponds to an app. Um, so you could download an app, type in that number or speak the number to your phone and hear all of the text from the exhibition. So it was a very high tech system um, designed by a very high tech designer, a designer who is blind and who really helped us think through all of the challenges of how we could deliver this. At the end of the day, um, probably very few blind people used the system. Um, and that is okay with us. Um, we feel that the system was also announcing to all visitors the principle of inclusion, right? So by having Braille be present, by having tactile graphics be present, it gives a signal like this is another language. This is an, another way that people experience the world and it should be made visible and present to everyone. In the process of researching this show and working with blind and low vision people, and consulting with them, meeting them, bringing them into the museum to experience the exhibition, I learned a lot. <laughs> A lot of things that I, that I didn't know before. A person who is blind um, may also be elderly. So the majority of, of blind people actually lose their sight later in life. They're not born blind. And elderly people have different needs. They're less likely to read braille, for example, than someone who grows up blind and goes to schools for people who are blind. Um, these elderly people may also be hard of hearing. Um, so you have to be mindful for audio uh, devices being of a significant, a significant volume for people that might struggle with hearing. Um, blind people are often low income. Uh, they often have difficulty with employment. Uh, so you have to make your services really accessible to people economically. Um, this was really interesting to me to meet blind people who describe themselves as visual thinkers. And that was like, wow, a really philosophical shift for me to get my head around that. Uh, but the idea of a visual thinker, a blind person who thinks in spatial terms, um, a blind person that doesn't only want text and linear text, but wants maps, and diagrams, right? Wants to really uh, understand the world spatially. So one of the designers we featured is this incredible man, Joshua Miele, um, who's a blind designer and computer scientist. And he developed a tactile map system that uses GIS to create maps of local neighborhoods, any neighborhood in the world 
um, a, a map can be output, a tactile map with this system that's both visual and braille at the same time and allows people to navigate their own neighborhood with a custom-made tactile map. Um, incredible project um, and really revolutionary. Another thing I learned is that a person who is blind may also see light and color. Uh, so blindness, like so many other things in life, is a spectrum. Um, and to be blind does not necessarily mean that you don't see any light. Um, so one of the amazing artists I met is Annie Least, and she uh, creates paintings. She's an incredible painter. She creates paintings that really represent her visual system. Um, and this is a painting about crossing the street. And so she can see the color red and she can see the do not cross sign with the red hand. And she can't make out the rest of the scene, but she can, she can make out that. So when she's crossing the street, she waits until she sees the red hand. And when the red hand stops, then she knows she can cross. She cannot see the white walking man, right? That doesn't have enough stimulus for her. Um, so it was really exciting to meet, meet her and work with her and learn different ways that people perceive the world. Um, it is really something that every designer should do <laughs> is really expose themselves to other ways of being. And in a museum, uh, you must, right? You must really think about the public and the great variety of people. A person who is blind may enjoy going to museums. Um, and I enjoyed bringing blind people into our exhibition. What I learned is that they weren't that interested in a high-tech app. Uh, the people that I met were more interested in a guided tour with a human being, taking them through the exhibition, showing them things that would be of interest, describing the room, um, and that sometimes a human solution is really the best. Um, so I learned so much about that. Um, it, it was really an inspiring project. Um, this is our book that we published, um, beautiful book, um, but this book is not accessible. <laughs> This book is print. Um, and those of you who are print designers are probably thinking you're like, well, I don't need to worry about this, right? Um, what I make uh, exists in a different realm. But actually as print designers, there's a lot we can do to make our work accessible simply by having an electronic version of whatever you're publishing. Um, so this book is not accessible. But this is our ebook, which is free on Cooper Hewitt's website to anyone who's interested. And this is accessible. So ebooks are accessible. Um, and we, we did the book so that every image has a visual description. And it's really not difficult to do that. It's just an extra editorial step. And it makes the work that you do accessible um, to more people, which is great. And here's some beautiful examples of design from the exhibition um, created for people with low vision. So this is a set of, of tableware created by Simon Kinnear, who's a visually impaired designer. Um, and he used these um, little black lines on these cups and these indentations so that someone can grasp the cup and actually feel the temperature of the cup change as you pour water or liquid into it because the material is thinner there. And the black line is a kind of um, target, right? So that if you have low vision, um, you can target that place where there's this uh, color contrast, right? Color contrast is very important for people with low vision. Um, or th this is how we set it up in the exhibition. We called it our little kitchen. Um, and we also had these dishes that are created for people with Alzheimer's disease, um, where bright colors help them to recognize a plate 
on the on the table as opposed to white which just disappears um, or this incredible bathroom fixtures created by Havy, um, which is designed for people with dementia and by making the functional elements of the bathroom red it allows someone to understand where are the parts of the bathroom that they need to interact with so the color not only is beautiful and decorative, but also has this cognitive function, which is really terrific. Um, or having colored um, hardware on a door that helps a person recognize what they need to interact with. This green push bar have you ever gone to open a door with a push bar and not known which side is correct? So by making one half color, the user instinctively goes and grasps that side and opens the door correctly without error. Um, and there are guidelines published for how to design an interior for people who have failing memory and low vision, that using color can really help people find their way um, to remember what floor they live on, uh, to recognize a chair, right? And so making everything gray and white isn't always the best solution. Um, and I find that uh, very exciting um, and inspiring. I wanna share some pieces with you that are about sound and about experiencing sound. Um, this was a piece by Roos Meerman. Right as you entered our exhibition, there was this big wall covered with fake black fur, you know, like fur for a fur coat or a stuffed animal. And when people rubbed their hands over this fur wall, it activated the instruments of an orchestra. <laughs> And it was such a beautiful piece of user interface design uh, because everybody wants to touch the big fur wall. It's like a giant puppy. <laughs> um, it just invited touching and then it rewarded people with this wonderful sound. Um, I'm gonna play you a little clip from a video. Oh, and my sound might not work. So I'm gonna stop share and then share correctly with the sound. Um, yes, I always forget that. There we go, it should work now. Um, this is a piece about the way that sound is shaped by architecture. So when we speak, the sound of our voice is affected by the textures in the room, the shape of the room, People doing um, sound engineering actually often add something called reverb to a sound. So if you create uh, music that's purely digital, for example, it often has an artificial kind of empty sound to it. Um, and so a, a filter is added to give it the sound of being in a real room. Okay, and that's called reverb. Um, and this beautiful film was made by uh, filming this singer in different architectural spaces. He's singing the same song, but he's moving from space to space and the sound changes completely. I'm gonna play you a, a, a clip, about a one minute clip to give you a sense of this. And, and it's done without any filters, no reverb. It's really created by the architecture itself, which changes the sound of this young man's voice. So I'm gonna play you a little clip. Um, and April, if, if the sound isn't playing, please just tell me it's not playing and we'll try to figure it out, okay? Can you hear it? Sound? Yeah, I can hear it. Great, thank you.
Just give me a good delay To make my last words stay Just give me a fast reverse To make my last words longer I don't wanna leave alone In nine thousand years No reverb But still it's just so I don't if death is not just a gossip Let me introduce you to the lawbreakers Let me show you the revolutionaries Can we not speak of what we want to reach? Grace! I think that is so beautiful. Um, this next piece is by Andy Thomas, who's a, um, an animator, and he collects the unique sounds that birds make. And then he creates animations that are completely abstract and yet convey the life of the creature and the atmosphere that they live in. And these sounds are amazing. They immediately bring you to another place. And Andy's animations really show how sound kind of enters a space and then leaves. It's called decay, right? That every sound has this element of decay that's actually part of the sound. <laughs> um, and I think you'll enjoy these, these really uh, loving animations of the sound that birds make. This next piece is by one of my graduate students at MICA, Ron Zhang, and she was fascinated by multi-sensory design. And she wanted to create a visual system that would translate sound into graphics. And so her system, when the sound is louder, the shape gets bigger, which is quite clear, right? Quite intuitive for a viewer. When the sound gets higher pitched, the shape gets sharper. So if we think about a high squeaky sound as being sharp and pointy and a low deep sound as being soft and round. So that's her visual system. And I'm gonna play you about a minute of her animation where she's taking the sounds in an environment and uh, it's typographic, of course, where graphic designers love letter, letter forms, but the elements of the type are made of these shapes that are changing in response to the sound. This is probably the weirdest piece in our exhibition. Um, it's called Tactile Headset. And it was these three wooden balls that have transducers inside that make the balls vibrate. And they would vibrate in different patterns like four different musical instruments, but pressing against your head. And of course we could never do any of these projects ever again, because <laughs> it's all like touching and being touching things that other people have touched. I mean, this was super weird and a super unique experience to be surrounded by sound, right? Which we're familiar, we're in a room and it's a noisy room and you're surrounded, but here you're surrounded by sound that's 
touching you, right? That's vibrating. Um, and that's called tactile sound. Very weird. <laughs> And there are practical applications. So I've shown you a couple of these sort of art pieces about experiencing tactile sound, uh, but this can be very practical as well. This is a music player created by uh, Liron Gino, a, a young product designer in Israel. And she created this um, music player where the sound is playing against the bones of your body. So it's vibrating and translating the pitches of the music um, into a vibration that you can feel. It's like jewelry. It has a social element. You can share it with another person. I'm going to move towards the end here um, and show you some things related to taste and sound and color and smell. Um, and it's really fun to, to think about how visual design can trigger um, feelings of, of taste and smell. Um, so choices of color and, and material can really put us in the mood of certain kinds of um, taste or smell experiences. Uh, these pieces by Emerging Objects are actually 3D printed with food. Uh, so vessels made out of sugar and coffee and curry, right? Materials that have a lot of smell. And the designers created these unique showcases that were hand blown out of glass with an opening in the top so that you could come down close and smell the objects inside. I think that's unique. I don't think any other museum has done that, had museum cases with a smell port. We thought that was really cool. Or this amazing furniture um, by Studio Collective, which is all designed to look like big pieces of cake or cookies or candy. Um, and the materials through their tactility and through their color remind us of food um, and everybody wants to eat this furniture. <laughs> it's really just so exquisite. Um, and we had samples of the materials that visitors could touch um, to really bring in that um, sensory experience. This is tableware by Jin Hyeon Jion. Uh, these beautiful handmade spoons that have different textures on them so that um, when you're eating something, your mouth is being stimulated, not just by the food, but by the texture of the spoon. Uh, and this is just uh, such a stunning idea. And it really brings to, to mind um, how completely multi-sensory eating is. You know, we, we are attracted to the visuality of food, the texture of it in our mouth, the, the, the crispiness or the coldness or the hotness or the slurpiness um, and the sound, right? The sound that crunchy food makes is very much part of our experience of it. Um, and we had one spoon that people could touch, not put in their mouth, <laughs> but people could touch and, and feel what that texture was like. Um, I can do that. Um, here's a little experiment I want to do with you. Um, tasting with your ears. Uh, so this wonderful mathematician and musician Bruno Metz in, in Argentina did an experiment where he, uh, with some other scientists, invited uh, musicians to create um, improvs in relationship to the basic tastes 
right? So sour, salty, sweet, um, and, and bitter. Um, and what they, then they analyze these improvisations to find what was common about them. What did all the sour music sound like? What did all the sweet music sound like? So sour was high pitch, short duration, and very dissonant. Whereas bitter was low pitch and low articulation, right? Softness between the elements. Um, so I, I hope you all are hungry to hear a little bit of music and see if you can taste it with me, okay? <laughs> this is sour, like lemons, limes, right? sharp, bright, bitter, coffee, the sweet, chocolate, earthy gray. Isn't that neat? <laughs> I just love that. Um, so, so these are some ideas about sensory design. Um, that I hope you will find inspiring and that you can apply to your work in some way. It's inclusive. It's about your well being. It's physical. It's embodied, right? It isn't just our eyes, it's our, it's our whole body that we experience design with. Um, it's mixed up with language and memory. Um, it's an experience, right? Sensory design is an experience. Um, and starting tomorrow, I'm going to be doing a workshop with some graduate students. I hope some of you will uh, join me. And I just wanted to give you a little taste of what we're going to do. Um, I've been doing these sensory design workshops in, in various settings. Um, this is one that I've done using uh, Sense Design by Christopher Brogius, um, where students get to smell a very unique uh, scent, unlike anything they've smelled before, and then interpret what the visual um, colors and textures and shapes might be um, related to that particular scent. And this is really fun. I mean, we do this with everybody brings their favorite art supplies and you spend time, you know, creating these unique um, collages and patterns and paintings and then scan the whole thing and really create um, a package uh, for these uh, scents. It's really fun. We're not gonna do this because we can't get all the perfume together, but we are gonna do a really cool project. Um, people that wanna participate in the workshop. So um, I should make it clear though, it's- It's uh, only for graduate students, right? Uh, it, it's part of our uh, MFA design class tomorrow. So I, it's not open to everybody, um, but just wanted to make that clear. We can talk yes, about yes. it in, in a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this was a student um, in uh, Beirut and the, the scent that she got designed by Christopher Brogius was called uh, CB Beast. And it was very musky kind of uh, manly scent. Um, and she designed these furry balls, basically <laughs> these furry polka dots that then became the pattern for her package, which was really cool. Um, so that's a really fun project. But what we're gonna do um, tomorrow is design your own brand of ice cream. So everybody is going to invent a brand of ice cream. We'll spend a little time just visualizing um, flavor, you know, what colors would you attach to different flavors? Um, what kind of flavor would represent your ideal ice cream? So I've had people do boozy ice cream and ice cream with marijuana in it and ice cream based on your childhood memories. Um, ice cream based on your cultural heritage. You know, ice cream, it exists everywhere. Um, it can be vegan, it can be anything, you know. Um, and so we do a little exercise with just- um, Ellen, 
Yeah, go ahead. Um, because I, I feel like um, I'd like to spend a little more time because this is a real workshop that starts tomorrow. Yeah. To just give the public a chance. I'd like to go over this again about the ice cream and what we talked about. But right now, what I'd like to do, uh, maybe for the next 20 minutes, is just open it up to absolutely That's and then we idea. can then i'll ask everybody who's not in uh design uh 514 to sign out of this um wonderful presentation and uh and incredible presentation and really useful information uh kind of state of the art of where some of this experiential work and exhibition is but uh, ex 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 yeah um so um, let me open it up to public uh, for students. Um, if you want to, um, uh, everybody hear me? It's like, oh uh, yeah, we hear you. To be um, shy asking questions, but usually the public isn't. Um, if you have a question, you can um, direct it to me in the personal chat, and I'll start to. Um, so far, I don't, see see I don't know if there's a chat option. I can't see it either. Yeah, I don't either. Interesting. So just yell out your question. Can I actually start with it? I actually would love to start with a question. Um, Thanks, all. Yeah, um, I loved your interesting um, presentation. It was great. My parents actually are deaf, and they both went to Gallaudet University. So it was interesting oh, wow. That's to, to get their opinion on it, too, because they actually believe that someone else invented deaf space because of the fact that um, Hansel was like a hearing guy who yes. barely ha had any expe like experience with sign language and things like that. They actually believe that Robert Servage should be credited with the invention of deaf space. I don't know if you know well, who that is. Thank you for sharing they, that. They yeah, think that is. he should be credited as he was the one who actually did a lot of the work. So they think that Hansel was definitely someone who's involved, but not someone who should be credited as the lead person being a Thank you person. so much yeah, for sharing no that problem. with me. Yeah, I yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. But um, it was really interesting. I love the spoon part a lot, like the textured spoons. I thought that part was so amazing. I definitely took a lot of pictures. So thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate that comment. Ellen, uh, Saul has a twin, so I thought that would be another- Oh, that's great. I, I, I do too. Yeah. Everyone, in my family, everyone in my family is deaf, except for me and my twin sister and my brother. So it was really cool to see someone else talk about this. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Saul. Um, any other questions uh, from anyone say hi ellen i have a question hi andy uh, how are you doing good it's good to see you <laughs> um so so i'm wondering if you in putting together this exhibition were looking at previous any kind of previous curatorial models in terms of um kind of the display of extra sensory kind of material right like i'm thinking about like art of scent or kenya Hara's haptic or you know, were there oh, other yeah, curatorial absolutely. models that you were looking at when you were kind of putting yeah. it together? Yeah, definitely. Um, there is a whole literature about sensory design uh, and Kenya Hara's book is incredible. And um, the book Eyes of the Skin by Juhani Palazma is like, every, anybody interested in this, it's this beautiful book. It's very short, very poetic. Um, incredible book. Who's so yes, architect? of course, we were influenced by those projects. What none of those projects do is talk about accessibility anywhere. It's just not so and that was like really an adventure and, and a necessary adventure. And one of the things that we did, you know, there's exhibitions about accessible design. And then there's exhibitions about the rest of design. <laughs> and what we tried to do is actually integrate examples of design, you know, for accessibility. We're just in the exhibition with everything else. There wasn't like a handicap section. There would be a beautiful work of art, 
next to a practical product created for to address a cognitive or sensory issue. Um, so we, we were really excited to, to, to try that. Well, that's interesting because Palasma is an art, was an architect. Uh, yes. The way mm -hmm. I think, uh, I'm not sure, I think he did, but, and that it wasn't at all having to do with the experiential or the, that's pretty crazy. Right, but, but he was asking architects to think about the sort of physicality of architecture and um, he uses this term ocular centrism, right? That, that architecture yeah. and design is all obsessed with, with the eyeball yeah. and that there's beauty to shadow, right? There's beauty to turning down the optical mm -hmm. and focusing on sound and touch and warmth and um, stuff like that. So it's a, that's a really great book. Okay, who else? Who else is brave? How about some students from our class? Although they're probably going to formulate tonight and hit you tomorrow pretty heavy, but I don't know. Hey, Brian, you must have uh, at least one question. <laughs> You're muted. But we get the hand gestures pretty clear. Yeah, well, the, the, it's my attempt to, to, to branch out of uh, the, my linguistic trap. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I was actually kind of wondering in retrospect, you mentioned you know, that this is an, a, a form of exhibition that would be hard to imagine mounting now. Um, and I, I can't help but wonder how just in a larger sense, I mean, this is an incredibly broad question, but in terms of, of the notion of, um, of, of, of trying to, 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 to reach audiences through multiple sense, with, with different sensory uh, kind of mm -hmm. uh, abilities, um, how you see the project of the mu a museum of that that is about modes of interaction um, goes forward. And I don't, I'm not, that sounds too bleak, but, but I mean like- It's very uh, challenging. Yeah, yeah. It's a very challenging moment for like science museums and children's museums, just playgrounds, yeah. right? So many environments that were predicated on physical touch, physical experience. It's very challenging and there's, you know, discussion among people in the blind community, like, you know, will there be no more tactile exhibits and tactile signage and touch screens? I mean, touch screens often aren't accessible to begin with, but um, there's so many things in contemporary world that we are supposed to touch, you know, elevator buttons. Um, lots of things, you know, pay, payment systems, you know. So, so now the invention of all these contactless methods to interact with the world, but those can leave people out, you know. So it, it is a big concern. Um, even though COVID-19 is not mostly um, conveyed through touch, but what about the next disease? Right. So in, in our in our exhibition, we had um, custom hand sanitizer designed by Christopher Brogius that people were encouraged to use before entering the exhibition. <laughs> but um, even with that, it, we could not do this now. It's tragic. <laughs> well, I think there's an opportunity for scented hand sanitizer that would fit. It was beautiful. The space yeah. of the. Uh, of the mm -hmm. exhibition to really just elaborate on that because some of it's really not only texturally disgusting but just the scent you're like ah. <laughs> you know like scented candles are also like on my hit list for uh you know criminal to make people smell <laughs> stuff like that but um there's one student um olivia who's in uh taiwan and uh i wonder if olivia if you have a question regarding the 
the bird piece that um, Ellen showed. I, um, I did some like project about the, like bird sound and oh. use like a visualization things to mm -hmm. uh, visualize the bird sound to relate it to the biodiversity. So um, like my case study is in Los Angeles. So I use that kind of uh, project to think like to help people to notice about like a biodiversity problem in Los Angeles because of like a hu human activities. So it is kind of like um, if there are a lot of like construction things, mm. so like bird sound will really like disappear. Mm. Yeah. So I feel like um, um, you share the bird sound and that's visualization things is like inspire me a lot. Uh -huh. yeah. And I was wondering like um, how, uh, do you have like any suggestions for like sound in like immersive design, uh, such as like AR or VR things, like how to visualize the sound in like interactive, like interactive design in like AR or VR. So like in emerging design. It sounds like a great challenge. I don't have a lot of advice for you how to do it, but in all, in all like film design and multimedia design, the interaction of sound and the visual is just essential. You know, that yeah. the sound immediately changes the emotional meaning of a scene. And, um, and even if it's abstract, you know, so I loved Andy Thomas's animation because it's completely abstract and yet it feels totally alive like those birds, you know, and even the, the sense of light and dark makes yeah. me feel like I'm in a forest, even though there's, it's, there's no eyes and beaks and wings, it's just <laughs> shapes, but it feels totally alive because it's following that pattern of the sound. It sounds like a great project, really. What's interesting the, is that it's so, there's infinite choices of what, how you choose to visualize that. You know, it's not like mm -hmm. it's an obvious that you decide to uh, take sound for generating um, a visual. And that's been really interesting to the bird piece that you showed was incredibly beautiful. And uh, it wasn't an accident that the sound, those bird sounds made that those visuals <laughs> because they're really works of art mm -hmm. uh, you know visual and um audio is audio a word uh, uh, <laughs> whatever visual and sound <laughs> um but um anyway it's really incredible examples and um it makes you for me it makes me <clears throat> think about um all the things i don't get to do as a designer or an artist <laughs> you know like any one of these things, you know, you could just imagine luxuriating. Up oh, there's the, there's the kingpin there. That's my son. You're kidding! Oh my god, <laughs> this giant! I thought it was Abbott. Anyway, um, uh, any other questions? Um, I have a question. Yeah. Cool. Um, first, just kind of a comment. My brother-in-law is deaf, and when he and my sister got married they specifically looked for a venue that had a floating wooden floor so that he could hear the vibrations, well, feel the vibrations right, right. In, order, in order to do the first dance at their wedding. So I just thought that's that beautiful. That really I love that. Vibrations as a communi communicative device. Um, but I was also just thinking about the smell piece that was mm -hmm. in the show and <laughs> knowing that so many people have now suddenly lost the sense of smell. Um, one of my best friends had COVID in October and he cannot smell anymore. At all. It's a true disability. And um, just thinking about how that might like change the read on these pieces, like you're inviting the experience of synesthesia um, and it feels like there's like a you know, with the music pieces that you were showing and the way that they would evoke sour or chocolate, that there would maybe be like a collective shift now in our interpretation of some of those synesthetic triggers, where now that smell of curry just 
knowing that it smells of curry might trigger some kind of trauma instead. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, that condition is called anosmia. Oh, and it's yeah. actually very common. Um, millions of people, even before COVID, experience it, um, sometimes permanently, sometimes temporarily. And it isn't just the absence of taste and smell because it actually creates um, unpleasant things, metallic and muddy. And so your friend is really suffering and it isn't just, it isn't just an absence. And actually in our piece, we had a beautiful like color wheel designed by a woman who had experienced anosmia that explained the, um, these negative um, associations. It was really cool, it's in the book too. So that was something we, we addressed. And of course now it's become um, really part of the vocabulary of daily life. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question that kind of, oh, sorry, just kind of along those same lines. So I know you were saying that like you like to go about your research and kind of discover new ways of thinking and being in the world. And I know that right now we can't really do a lot of the things that you kind of are researching in that form, but do you, have you found anything in this time of like COVID and quarantine that has made you want to research a new aspect that you hadn't thought of? Or like, I mean, I know there's so many, but like, um, I guess, what is your main point of like new learning and being? <laughs> well, actually I'm working on an exhibition about design and COVID, <laughs> which is opening next year. Um, it's been an incredible period of creativity actually, and of altruistic design and um, open source and innovation and transformation of the healthcare system to become um, you know more virtual and distributed and obviously a terrible time um, so I've been spending a lot of time working on that and uh, following this slow moving catastrophe and seeing it evolve and seeing how designers are responding it's quite interesting so that's a tough one. It's very um, intense. Um, thanks for asking that. Any other uh, brave brave people? I have a question. Cool. <laughs> Hi. 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 Um, Hi. I would love to hear your thoughts in sort of following up with this question about the uh, unbelievable resurgence of craft, handicrafts um, <laughs> because of COVID. And I certainly am yes, one related. of those people. Yeah. So I, I am really curious about how that's factoring in, in what you're seeing. And, um, and also, is that part of you, how you're looking <clears throat> at the exhibition you're curating? And um, what are your thoughts on that? We haven't really looked at that, um, but that is like a big cultural response that is very interesting along with like cooking and, you know, people being more domestic and interior. Um, but that, that's very interesting. Um, there'd be, it, that would be a cool vein to study is like, well, what are, what are people making and why? I, I think the right. other aspect of that that's kind of interesting is, you know, is, is there a possibility of there being a new arts and crafts kind of moment in this context, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and subsistence farming too. <laughs> like, you know, people just wanting to be more off the grid and uh, be able to take care of themselves more. Yeah, very interesting. I like your crafts behind you. <laughs> the tactility is beautiful. Thanks. <laughs>